Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Meet Touchstone Essentials. I'm Craig Daly, Vice President of Global Sales, and I'm here with Cindy Clement, uh, who's going to talk tonight about the bad things of antibacterials, right? That's, that's what we're exactly discussing right. tonight. Yeah. yeah, so that's kind of interesting. And as you know, antibacterials have made their way into everything. They're in soaps, they're in garbage can liners, they're in everything you can think of. So we're yeah. going to talk about that tonight. And we're so privileged to have Cindy Clement here with us tonight, uh, who's just an acclaimed speaker, published author, nutritionist, herbalist, adjunct professor. She teaches the doctors about nutrition, and we feel so privileged to have Cindy with us. So Cindy, uh, take it away. Let's talk about antibacterials. Let's. But first, I got to show you this picture. This is my granddaughter. Whenever she comes to our house, uh, we make carrot juice. She loves her carrot juice. She'll drink, drink 12 to 16 ounces at a time. And I'm always telling people we need to educate children's taste buds when they're young. Get them used to the taste of super green juice. Get them used to the taste of the organic super protein. In fact, Lillian is so excited about nutrition that I just yesterday, I was invited by her school to come in and teach nutrition in the four second grade classes. So yeah, we've got That's to get, great. Them. we've got to teach these kids. Teach gotta, them while they're young. I love it. Teach though, you know, get those taste buds going when they're young. Let me see if my clicker works. It does. Okay. So let's talk about antibacterials. First of all, what I like to do in these presentations about these chemicals is just to empower. I mean, it can be quite depressing, I must admit, but I, what I'm trying to do is to empower everyone um, to recognize where we are being exposed to these environmental toxicants. And then, of course, how best to avoid it. We're never going to avoid them all, but we can certainly cut back on them. And then when I talk about the health effects that these chemicals cause, I want you to understand that they are these health effects are more likely related to what we call recurrent exposure over time and and it also depends on the size or of the exposure of, of the doses we call it as well as the timing so what age we are exposed how much of it we were exposed how often throughout our lifetime we were exposed so those are all all really important things to think of when we do these presentations on these chemicals. So we're going to talk specifically about an antibacterial called triclosan. And this was banned by the FDA in certain soap products. But this antimicrobial, it, it still is in many, many, many consumer products, like Craig said, including toothpaste. And as consumers, we are exposed to these products um, you know, through ingestion, through skin exposure, through things like this. And numerous studies have showed that there are detectable levels of triclosan in our skin, in our, in our urine, as well as in our blood. Now, the global use of triclosan, now remember, this is just one of many antibacterials, but the global use of triclosan was estimated to be a $68 million market in 2021. It's expected to hit $12 million in sales by 2030. So, wow. So initially this chemical was developed in about 1964 and it, it, it was developed because of its um, antimicrobial and antifungal properties. And they used it as a component in deter detergents used for surgical scrubs. So that was the intention originally. But the evidence of the negative effects of this chemical, anywhere from endocrine disrupting to reduced sperm counts, as well as the creation of these antibiotic superbugs, as we call them, the ones that are antibiotic resistant. Now, all of this led the FDA in 2016 to tell companies to stop making hand and bar soaps as, as well as body washes that contain that compound. But the recommendation oddly did not extend 
to toothpaste or mouthwashes where triclosan is still in use, as well as, as Craig mentioned, in many other products. So researchers say that the amount of triclosan in our household products is producing a significant increase in the resistant bacteria that we're facing today. Um, for instance, let's talk about some of these other products that it's found in. It's found in your plastic cutting board. It's in your coated metal knives. Craig mentioned the trash bags and the garbage cans. It's also found in your sponges, in brooms, in food storage containers. It's in ceramic tiles and hot tubs, mattresses, carpets, shower curtains. And this is why I say we can't get away with no exposure. Our cell phone covers, our computer keyboards, our mouse pads, vacuum cleaners, food coolers when you're going camping, mulch, plastic lawn furniture, tents, awnings, protective sports gear, school supplies, toys, clothing, baby changing stations, pacifiers. I mean, literally the list goes on and on where these antimicrobials are found. Now, as I mentioned, it's added to mouthwash, it's added to cosmetics, to skincare, lotions, creams, shampoos. Remember, the FDA said stop putting it in, in soap, but they left it in everything else like deodorant and combs and hairbrushes and um, just earplugs and just so many things. And the reason that they add it to the food packaging is to extend the shelf life because that will prevent the microorganism growth and it also helps to prevent stains and odors. But that's if you're eating a lot of processed foods. We don't eat a lot of processed foods, so I can say that's at least one area that I'm not being exposed through. Now, interestingly, the FDA found that antibacterial products, all of these like triclosans, they provide no benefit over soap and water. And the American Medical Association recommends that these antibacterial soaps and, and products not be used in the, in the home because they are encouraging bacterial resistance to antibiotics as a whole. So when we talk about skin absorption, we can be exposed through clothing, but the products that contain triclosan may be challenging to, to kind of find because they're not always labeled as triclosan, but rather they mention something called just antibacterial. So fiber and clothing that have triclosan in, incorporated into them are referred to by many of these patented names. So if you're buying socks that are from Microban or, or Ultra Fresh or Monolith or, or Batonix or Amacor, those are triclosan coated clothing. And again, skin absorption is one of the ways that we are exposed. Now, this triclosan that is in use is contaminating our waterways. The U.S. Geological Survey studied 95 different contaminants in the waterways, and they showed triclosan as one of the most frequently detected and had some of the highest concentrations in the U.S. streams. In fact, triclosan has been detected in anywhere between 75 and 100% of the rivers, the estuary waters, and the lakes in North America, Asia, Oceania, as well as in Europe. And the, currently there are no state or federal regulatory limits for triclosan in these aquatic systems. And how it gets into the waterways is that Triclosan, of course, if you're washing your hands or brushing your teeth or doing whatever, it's washed down the drains and then it's only partially removed in those wa wastewater treatment plants. And then the sewage sludge from the wastewater treatment plants is then spread on the land and then the triclosan leaches down through the soil as, and then it runs off into the surface water from the fields. Now, it degrades really slowly in the waterways, it's been detected as long as 266 days after application. But in the human body, 
um, it's it, it, it's only there for about 65 hours. But because again of that constant exposure. So if you were exposed to triclosan 65 hours later, half-life, almost gone, give it another half-life of another 65 days gone from your body. However, because we are continuously exposed, they did some studies in 2012, and they found that 10 out of 11 liver samples and 7 out of 11 adipose fat tissues that were sampled indicated that it did have a bioaccumulative effect because of that recurrent exposure. Now, triclosan has also been detected, like I said, in the urine, but in our blood plasma, as well as in breast milk. And of 62 different milk samples that they tested from the mother's milk banks in Texas and California, 81% of this breast milk contained triclosan. Now, the detection, of course, in breast milk raises that question as to the potential adverse effects in infants today. So, um, and when you're when you're exposed to this broad range of microbial agents early in life, what that can do is then suppress the development of the immune system and increase a predisposition to allergic diseases. In fact, the urinary levels of triclosan and hay fever or, or allergy diagnosis in children have been positively uh, associated. So the more of it in their body, the weaker their immune systems are. Now, triclosan is also a potential, what's called an endocrine disruptor. And in the case of, of this particular chemical, it mimics thyroid hormones and binds to thyroid hormone receptor sites, therefore blocking the thyroid hormones that are made in our body. We've all they've also seen decreases in levels of hormones that are involved in reproduction, including things like LH, which is luteinizing hormone or FH, uh, FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, pregnenolone, testosterone. So it is has this potential to be an endocrine disruptor. Now, some studies have shown that triclosan stimulates progesterone and estrogen secretion, but it also decreases the human chorionic growth hormone, which is essential when, when one is pregnant. So this triclosan exposure then can have a negative impact on the pregnancy's term as well as on the fetus. The University of California Davis researchers found that triclosan, which is really fascinating, it elevated calcium levels in cells in these young children, and that could potentially affect their neurological functioning and their neurodevelopment. So this is, again, just one chemical of the 80,000 that we're exposed to. So just think of these antibacterials and, and how you can avoid them as best you can. Now, as I mentioned, the childhood exposure is, is concerning. You know, they don't really know how it alters the growth and development fully. The largest study that's been conducted was in uh, Norwegia, and they had uh, 623 children, and they followed them for three years. And they found that the increased urinary levels of triclosan were associated with asthma and inflammation of the mucous membranes. And then of course, the other potential health effects included that antibiotic resistant and increasing rate of allergies as well as skin irritation. Um, I can tell you that when my granddaughter, who's now almost 17, when she was just a really young, young girl in preschool, they wanted them to use a lot of that um, antibacterial gel on their hands, you know, before they ate. And my granddaughter's hands broke out and almost looked blistered. And so we know that she's definitely sensitive to this. So, you know, watch those little ones, right? Um, and by the way, females are shown to have significantly higher levels of triclosan because we have different hygiene habits than males. We use more of the triclosan, you know, uh, makeup with triclosan and more beauty products, as well as the tampons that have all been treated with triclosan. So 
when we disrupt the gut, we know we're in trouble, right? And we know that studies are showing that endocrine disrupting compounds with antimicrobial properties alter the bacterial flora in our human microbiome. And what was really interesting is that rapid rise in obesity parallels with the use of triclosan because it, it as they as they're they're um, projecting anyway, is that it negatively modifies that gut bacteria. Now we know that BPA, the rise in BPA usage has also created more of this obesity. So it's just so important that we detox on a daily basis. Um, the gut microbiome really has attracted the attention of researchers and, and medicine in regards to its correlation to metabolic syndrome, which we've talked about, mood disorders, cardiovascular disease, inflammatory bowel disease, as, as well as that obesity. So it's just really important to detox. So of course, we need to detox and it's more of on a daily basis, because again, just remember, this is just one chemical. And there are about 80,000 out there that we're exposed to. So while we attempt to avoid the plethora of chemicals to which we're exposed as best we can, we need to detoxify. And how we do that is with probiotics, with fulvic minerals plus, with pure body and pure body extra, as well as CBD oil. So let's find out why. Um, probiotics, they induce changes in the intestinal microbiota and they stabilize that microbial community. They also improve that gut barrier and reduce that low grade inflammation. So there are four in particular that are really beneficial. And the first one is bacillus coagulans. And this is a, a bacterial strain that regulates that microbiota. It inhibits the growth of pathogenic bacteria, and then it significantly benefits the immune system of the host. Whereas lactobacillus gasseri is, is, first of all, it's prevalent in both infant and adult microbiota. But what that particular strain does, it helps to maintain that gut homeostasis. So we talk about homeostasis a lot, and that's just keeping everything in balance. So that particular strain, the, the, the El Gasseri, that is really good for gut homeostasis. Now the bifo, uh, Bifidobacterium bifidum is one of the first microbes that colonize the human GI tract. And it's one of the most common found in the body of mammals. And it too, of course, has a positive uh, health effect on the host. Now, remember, when we when we heal the gut, we're working with our immune system and we're working with our brain and nervous system. So we've got that, that bi-directional communication, the gut-brain access. So we've got to keep that gut healthy. We also have more immune cells in our gut than in our entire, um, um, anywhere else in our body. And so we have to keep that healthy. So when we use these probiotics and we create that homeostasis and we create a better environment for the good bacteria to grow, we're healthier in our immune system and in our body and mind and and whatever, our whole body benefits. Now there were clinical trials with Bifidobacterium longum, which demonstrated that it counters the effects of obesity. It offers protection against inflammatory bowel diseases because it can reduce that inflammation. Um, but it's also effective in alleviating infectious diseases because it boosts the immune system. So then where do we get these probiotics, right? Well, Super Green Juice provides all four of those different bacterial um, uh, probiotic strains with about a 1 billion colony forming units or 1 billion CFUs per serving. The uh, Super Greens Plus D, on the other hand, that one includes over 5 billion colony forming units. Uh, per serving. So the gut is constantly being replenished with this beneficial bacteria. And, and this can protect the intestinal uh, barrier and keep that microbiota balanced. 
Now, when it comes to the importance of the gut microbiome balance, there's this uh, microbiologist at the California Institute of Technology. His name is Sarkis Masmanian. But what he said is, and think of it as the gut bacteria, he said, it's like a garden. You're less likely to have weeds growing if you have lush vegetation, but without this vegetation, the weeds can potentially take over. So let's kind of think about that is the gut. So if the gut, the gut is less likely to have an overgrowth of the wrong kind of bacteria, if we have that lush good bacteria. So it's just really important and 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 fulvic acid can help. Remember fulvic acid is is a component of of humans and that's that highly nutritious layer of the earth. Um, and it's that layer that feeds the plants and ensures that they grow strong and healthy. Well, that same layer that nourishes the plants also nourishes the human digestive tract and has the ability to boost that good bacteria to repopulate and form that healthy microbiome environment to help improve that gut functioning. Now, when it comes to zeolite, there was a clinical review published in 2018. It was in the peer-reviewed journal called Frontiers in Pharmacology, and it showed that zeolite activates the immune system. It assists in bone regeneration. It's crucial to detoxification, has an antioxidant effect, and it supports the gut microbiota and the cellular integrity of the gut. And of course, size does matter. So pure body extra is has those nano sized particles that can reach the body on a cellular level. And pure body, the zeolite particles are sized to detox the body and the gut. So we've got help there. So how do we avoid triclosan and other antibacterial chemicals? Well, one thing you can do is adhere to fish advisories. And we've talked about this before. All you need to do it, it, to Google is just put national listing of fish advisories. That's it. National listing of fish advisories, EPA. And it will take you right to their website. And you can check the rivers and lakes and estuaries in your area and see if the fish, uh, if the fish are safe for consumption. You can also go to environmental working groups groups skin deep website and all you have to do with that is just google ewg skin deep and you can check all your personal care products including tampons for triclosan there's also an interesting website it's it's beyond pesticides and it's in their food and water watch um, portion of the website and it lists companies that have pledged to be triclosan free. So that again, that's called Beyond Pesticides. You can just Google that. Um, Food and Water Watch. And it's part of their website. And again, they'll show you who's who has pledged. I am triclosan free. I won't do that anymore. I know Bed Bath Beyond does not put triclosan in any of it. It's got other chemicals in their products, but not triclosan. So Here's who you can help. Who do you know that's pregnant or nursing or planning pregnancy? Who do you know that consumes fish or prepared foods, packaged foods? Who do you know that uses personal care products? Who doesn't? Who do you know that wears antibacterial socks and clothing or uses household products or that has young children? Because folks, these are the people that you can help. So make sure that you share this information with them. And next time, we're going to be talking about healthy vision. Back to you, Craig. Well, thank you, Cindy. That's great information. Um, boy, we know that it's everywhere and we've got to be uh, vigilant in making sure that we take care of ourselves and our loved ones and those around us. So let's uh, let's think about these things and be aware of them. Thank you for making us more aware of triclosan and and where where it's at and how we can uh, overcome the negative effects. Isn't it crazy. I mean, isn't it crazy when you think about how on earth are we all still alive? <laughs> We're to it's kind of insane because triclosan is just one thing. There's so many. Uh, it's really kind of crazy where we've gotten to, but thank you. With your help, we're all going to be safe. We appreciate you. Thank you, Cindy. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being on tonight. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you next time. Good night. Bye-bye.